Amen. John 3, 16. How many of you know that verse? Yes. Whether it's KJV, NIV, ESV, or what have you, will you say it with me if you know it? Say it however you memorize it, all right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. What a beautiful verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What an incredible promise. What an incredible verse. Even in our increasingly religiously ill-informed society, our biblically illiterate world, this statement from Jesus stands out still as one of the most loved and best known summaries of the Bible in one single verse. The gospel in a nutshell. I wonder, just think, don't necessarily shout out, but think, what really stands out to you as you look at John 3.16, this very familiar text? What, what stands out to you? Maybe it's love. Isn't that one that stands out to most of us? God's so loved. Or, or maybe it's the world. You think this crazy, messed up world and everyone in it, God loved the whole world? Or his son, his his one and only or only begotten son, or, or perhaps it's this word, whoever. When I was a kid, I was taught to put my name in there, that if Jason believes in him, he should not perish for have eternal life. Or maybe it's belief, and you wonder, well, what's, what's belief, and how can I grow in my belief and know that I truly have saved faith? Or maybe it's, it's life and eternity. But what one word we sometimes quickly gloss over in this beautiful verse of love and salvation is the very reason why salvation is so necessary. It's this word right here. It starts with a P. Debbie said it. Perish. Everybody say it with me. Perish. Perish. Yes. If you joined us on Wednesday nights in the past and when we've taught this Bible verse to the kids, and I'm thankful for the kids that come from our community on Wednesday nights even now, uh, no kids here this morning. Um, it's just not the same when the kids are out here. I always tell the parents that. There's just a different energy when we don't have a bunch of kids making noise and running around. Um, but when we teach the kids this Bible verse, John 3, 16, perish. So we have these motions, you know, for God so uh, loved or loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever the author made to everybody believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And when we say life, they all jump. But the most dramatic moment in the verse comes when we say the word perish. We had our kids help us invent a hand motion for perish. You know what they came up with? They come up with like basically grabbing their neck and falling over on the ground. So when you see the kids quote this verse, you see that this idea of perish really stands out. How wonderful those words. Should not perish, but have eternal life. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about this eternal life. We're going to talk about heaven. But this Sunday, we're going to talk about a, a difficult subject. As we continue our series, what did Jesus actually say? The words of Christ in red, the words that Jesus actually said. One subject that Jesus talks about more than anyone else in the entire Bible. One subject that takes up a high percentage of all of his teachings is this very unpopular, very difficult subject what Jesus actually said about hell. Hell. Did you know Jesus has more to say about hell than any other person in the Bible? In fact, while Jesus emphasized love and forgiveness and salvation, much of our understanding of hell, the eternal state of the unredeemed, and Hades, 
the intermediary state of the unsaved, much of it comes from the very words of Christ Jesus himself. You see, Jesus came to provide what? What did he come to do? To provide salvation. He came to provide salvation. His very name means he shall save his people from their sins. That's what the angel said. You can see in the back of your bulletins. That's what the angel said to Mary. You shall name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus was clear, Luke 19, 10. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Those words we receive with wonder and with grace and with love. But we have to stop and ask ourselves, save from what? Why do we need saving? Mark 10, 45 says, Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Save the lost from what? Ransom the many from whom? What could Jesus possibly mean? The answer in a word, H-E-L-L. Hell. Hell. Wrath. Suffering. Separation. Anguish. Fire, darkness, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. Not temporary, not momentary, but eternal, conscious, forever and ever without end. Today we're going to continue our series and look at the words of Jesus. We're not going to be able to give an exhaustive teaching on hell. And so if you have questions that come up, and there will be some specific questions. Some people will want to know more about purgatory, and believe it or not, that subject actually belongs to next Sunday a little more about what happens to uh, the redeemed when they are saved. And the misunderstanding that people have about purgatory, of course, is not real. That's a misunderstanding. Some people will say, well, what about this sin? Or what if somebody sins right before they die? And all of these questions, I'd be really happy to have a, a good personal conversation with you about any specific questions that might come up and how the gospel of Jesus Christ deals with those questions. But let's consider hell briefly this morning and what the scriptures say and what Jesus says. First of all, we need to know from the scriptures, what is death? How does the scripture define death? Genesis 2, all the way back in the very beginning, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. God created a beautiful world where there's no suffering, no mourning, no crying, no pain, no death. And the Lord God commanded a man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For on the day that you eat of it, you shall surely, what? Die. Die. So there's the first mention in the Bible of death. <laughs> death and rebellion. Death and right. sin. Death and the wage of sin go hand in hand. First of all, we see that physical death is defined in Scripture as the separation of the spirit from the body. So there are two parts of us, essentially. The spirit and the body, the material and the immaterial. The Scripture says that physical death occurs when the body, the physical body, dies the spirit is thereby separated from it. James 2.26 literally says, quote, the body apart from the spirit is dead. That's why when we go to a funeral service, even if it's an open casket and the body is lying there in front of us, that, that body is not our loved one. Our loved one is no longer there. We recognize that. It's becoming empty shell for the spirit of that loved one has departed. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So physical death is the separation of the spirit from the body. And if it makes you uncomfortable to think about death, it ought to. The apostle Paul was uncomfortable when he thought about death. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
He speaks of death as being naked or unclothed, just as you would be very uncomfortable to walk down Montrose Avenue without any clothes on. So it makes you very uncomfortable. It makes you very uncomfortable to think about the spirit, the real you, so to speak, not being clothed by your body. We, we can't imagine what that might be like. Now, Tanya was just telling me the other day about a movie coming out from Angel Studios that does a very in-depth study into many near-death experiences. And it's going to be interesting, as that's portrayed on film, to see how people respond to that. And I'm very interested to watch that as well. And while that's interesting to consider, of course, our main information about death and what happens comes not from the experiences of others, but rather from the truth of God's word and what God has to tell us. So first of all, physical death is the separation of the spirit from the body. Second of all, we see spiritual death. Physical death, spiritual death. Spiritual death is the separation of the sinner from the creator. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, you may know the story. God gave him that command not to eat of the fruit of the trees, the knowledge of good and evil. Eve, tempted by the serpent, took of it and gave some to her husband who was idly standing by. And they fell into sin. Creation cursed. It says in Genesis 3, 22, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us and knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden toward the ground from which he was taken. So we see that the result of Adam and Eve's sin was separation, a break in their fellowship with God. It says he drove out the man from that perfect paradise, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so separation is the result of sin. Romans 6.23, another verse that you may have hidden down in the wells of your heart. What's Romans 6.23 say? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now even today as we talk about the wages of sin, we don't want to forget the blessed second half of that truth. The gift of God is eternal life life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. All right, so I want you all to focus in on me for a moment. Let's make this real personal. If you were to die tonight, what would happen to you? To you. Not the body that we spend so much of our time focusing on, but to you. What would really happen to you if tonight your physical body were to die? Where would you go? What would you have? Would you simply cease to exist? Some believe that. Many more and more in our world believe that. I think it's a cop-out. I don't know if they really believe that or if that just allows them to live however they want without fear of consequences. Would your life be but a memory? Would the afterlife be nothing more than the memories that continue on? In the lives of those that you've touched. That's not what Jesus teaches. Jesus teaches two very clear alternatives, and only two. Only two alternatives. On the one hand, as he says to the thief on the cross, who turns from his sins and trusts in King Jesus in the very last seconds of his life, he says, Today you will be with me in paradise. And so that's one option. We'll talk about that next week. Paradise. The intermediate state awaiting the glory of resurrection. But on the other hand, you have a second option. For those who are not saved. For those who have not trusted in Christ. Jesus calls it Hades. Using the Greek term Hades. In the Old Testament, sometimes the word Sheol or the grave is used. But Hades is that temporary intermediate state of suffering where the unsaved dead await final judgment. There's only two options. 
paradise with Jesus or Hades separated from Jesus. There's only two options at that moment after you breathe your final breath, after your heart stops. One second, one millisecond after you die. Paradise or Hades. With Christ or separated from Christ. Bliss or anguish. Two options. And guess what? There are no second chances. No second chances. If you like hard rock music, I encourage you to uh, Google or Spotify, search White Cross and their song, No Second Chances. If you don't like hard rock Christian music, don't, don't give it any time. No second chances. White Cross, No Second Chances. Two options, No Second Chances. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 9 says that you are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. No reincarnation, no second chances, no purgatory, no soul sleep. It's either immediate conscious enjoyment of God's presence in paradise, or it's immediate conscious suffering and separation in Hades, awaiting either final resurrection to glory or final resurrection to eternal judgment. Now remember, Jesus' very name means what? He came to save his people. From their sins. He came to seek and save the lost, to give us life as a ransom. So even as we talk about Hades and hell and the final moments that remain, I want you to remember that Jesus came to be mighty to save, to save us from our sins. A second thing we want to focus on today is Hades. Say that word with me. Hades. This is the intermediate state of the unsaved and Really, I think the, the best place to go to learn more about this intermediate state after physical death and before the resurrection is Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, if you'll turn there in your Bibles, Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. We touched on this story last Sunday as we talked about the fleeting value of worldly riches. We talked about the rich fool. We talked about the rich guy who lived in great excess behind his gates. The rich man described here, Lazarus, the poor man, laid at his gate. We talked last Sunday about how each one of us is worth infinitely more than the amount of money in our bank account or the equity that we have laid up. Because how can you measure the worth of the eternal soul by this little blip of material existence here upon the current earth? So it says in Luke 16, verse 19, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. All right, I'm going to come down now as we tell the story, all right? Get a little okay. closer for story time, okay, Brad? That okay with you? Yes. Yeah. All right, all right. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. Now, who doesn't want to be like that rich man? Yeah. No Being clothed in purple was a sign of great wealth, so he was honored by all around him. Fine linen, feasted sumptuously. Recently, I've been feasting sumptuously on ice cream before bed at night. I, I recognize that that is an excess, isn't it? All of us, even... All of us enjoy excesses. At his gate was laid a poor man. Now, here's a man who had no excess. In fact, poverty stricken, he didn't even have the basic necessities of life that he needed. A poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and lived his soul. Jesus is painting a picture of somebody who's at the heights of society life, and somebody who's at the very dregs, the very bottom, as far down as you can imagine, the guy literally living in the gutter. It says the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. What does that tell us? That this poor man trusted in the Lord, that even in the midst of his great poverty, he found hope in the Lord and in his promises. He was a member of God's covenant people, even though he was neglected 
by those who should have helped him. It says the rich man also died and was buried. By the way, did you notice the poor man died, but it doesn't say that he was buried. Maybe he didn't even have the honor of a proper burial. Maybe he was taken outside the city gates of Jerusalem to a place where the unmourned for dead were buried. But the rich man, he died. He was buried. They probably had people there, paid mourners, weeping and wailing for him. And many people came to the funeral. Maybe there was a great respite. Maybe there was a great dinner of some kind afterwards. Great honor was given to him. But he wasn't there. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off. There's separation. Far off. And Lazarus, the poor man from his gate, was at Abraham's side. By the way, another name for paradise is Abraham's bosom. To be close to Abraham and to the sons and daughters of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. He called out the rich man and said, Father Abraham, please have mercy upon me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger excess upon excess and delicacy upon delicacy. And now all he wants is just one drop of water upon his tongue. Remember, this is not hell. This is not the final state, the lake of fire. This is Hades. This is the intermediate state, almost like a, a prison uh, or jail cell, if you will, awaiting final sentencing, awaiting final judgment. Father Abraham, send him, cool my tongue. I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. Now be careful that you don't read this and think that all rich people are going to Hades and all poor people are going to Abraham's bosom, all right? That's clearly not the point of the story. But in his wealth, this rich man trusted in himself, not in the Lord. In his poverty, the poor man trusted in the Lord in spite of his terrible circumstances. Now he is comforted here. You are in anguish. And look at what he says. This is very instructive. Besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who have passed from here to you may not be able. So in other words, there are no field trips from paradise to Hades, and none may cross from there to us. There are no respite days from Hades to paradise. And he said, then I beg you, Father Abraham, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that they may warn them also, lest they too come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said to Abraham, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And now Jesus is leaping forward, isn't he? He's foreshadowing us what's going to happen in his own rejection and death and resurrection and yet continued majority rejection by his own people. He said to them, if they do not Hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Luke 24, 37, we see the fulfillment of that. As even at his resurrection, the religious leaders continue to reject Jesus. This is a very clear picture here in Luke chapter 16 of what this intermediate state of Hades is all about. So according to Jesus himself, what can the unforgiven, unsaved, unredeemed sinner expect one second after his or her final breath? What can the unrepentant, unyielding, pride-filled woman or man look forward to when a steady thump, thump, thump of the heartbeat becomes a flat line on the screen? Separation from those he loves. It's not a party in hell. People sometimes joke, well, I'm going to go to hell and party with all my friends. No, it's utter, complete separation, darkness. Separation from the righteous. 
separation from God and his love, separation from anything that makes life livable or misery more bearable. Right now in this world, even the worst sinner still experiences the warmth of God's sunshine. Even the worst wicked person still experiences the refreshing nourishment of God's rains, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. In hell, there will be none of that. Separation from everything that makes life li livable, misery more bearable. Separation from joy, separation from happiness, separation from light, from comfort, from love. In short, separation from God. Now, thank God... There is nowhere like this on earth. You think things are bad here? There's nowhere like this here on this earth. So long as your heart's beating, so long as there's air in your lungs, there is life, there is hope. But after your heart stops, then what? Hades is bad, but it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. The wicked imprisoned in Hades, again, are like criminals who are charged with a crime being held without bond, awaiting their trial, their day before the one who is holy, righteous, just, and true. The judge, the jury, and the executioner are one. And on that day, those who are in Hades will have no second chances. There will be no opportunity to plead their case before the holy judge. What awaits them next? is resurrection with an incorruptible, eternal body. All will be raised, Daniel 12 says. Revelation 20 confirms. Hell, the final destination of the unsaved. Now, first of all, about hell, we see that hell is a destination to be avoided at any cost. Hell is a destination to be avoided at any cost. In your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 and verse 42. It says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Now, for you Bible students out there, this is an example probably of what's called autonomy where one thing stands for something else. The sins that are related here, like the hand probably represents theft, stealing something, or the murder, uh, killing of someone with the hand, or foot maybe representing going somewhere, uh, as was read for us earlier from Psalm 1, like walking in the council, the ungodly, or that kind of thing. The eye may represent coveting, or sexual lust, or adultery, or something along those lines. Metonymy. But Jesus makes it very clear that at any cost, hell is a destination to be avoided. And so repentance, humble repentance from sin, even being willing to cut off sinful influences as we seek to follow Jesus. So important for us to remember. Matthew 13 verse 41 says, the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I should mention this word for hell. Anybody know what word that is in our Bibles? The word uh, behind that? Gehenna. Gehenna, yes. It's a reference to the Valley of Hinnom outside Jerusalem, which was a burning rubbish heap. A burning rubbish heap. It was where refuse was placed, maybe foul filth, dung, sometimes even bodies and carcasses, and it was sort of perpetually smoking, perpetually burning outside of 
the city. That's kind of how they took care of their refuse and their garbage in that day. And it was an appropriate picture of hell. Gehenna, terrible place of suffering, fiery furnace, Jesus refers to it as. Matthew chapter 25, verses 41 through 45, Matthew chapter 25 says, The eternal fire of hell was stoked for the devil and his angels. Now this is important for us to remember. Jesus makes it very clear in these verses why the fires of hell were stoked in the first place. A typo on the screen is Matthew 25, verse 41. This is the separation of the sheep and the goats. He will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, if you choose to reject Jesus, then you are aligning yourself with the devil and his angels. And if you reject Jesus, that means your destiny is not paradise with Jesus, but rather you've aligned yourself with the devil and his angels, meaning that your destiny is now destruction. Your destiny is now the eternal fire, as Jesus refers to it. For he says, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. I was naked, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Notice, notice here that Jesus equates following him, not with just simply a, a verbal affirmation of, yes, I believe in Jesus. But like James does in the book of James, he says, faith without works is dead. And so it's works that show and demonstrate the reality of our saving faith. And they will say to me, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, stranger or naked, sick or in prison, did not minister to you? I will say to them, truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do it unto me. So Jesus makes it very clear the eternal fire of hell was stoked for the devil and his angels. In the next verse, in the next verse we see that hell is <clears throat> for how long? For his. Forever. 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 Verse 46. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I want you to see there. Just as life is eternal, and we rightfully celebrate the eternality of life, everlasting life, John 3, 16, so also the punishment is eternal. Two things from these verses in Matthew 25. The eternal fire of hell is stoked for the devil and his angels. Who's in charge of hell? Satan. No. No. God governs hell. God made hell for the devil and his angels. We have this cartoon theology of the devil down there gleefully poking people with his trident. That's not what the scripture teaches. Hell is a place of God's wrath. God governs hell, not Satan. It was created for the devil and his angels. We know in the book of Revelation that after the, the great battles of Armageddon, the great supper of God, that the beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet, will be thrown alive in the lake of fire. And then we know that after the millennium and that great gathering of armies, that Satan himself will be thrown into the lake of fire. And then in the very end of the great white throne judgment, all those whose names are not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life will join the beast and the false prophet and the devil himself in the lake of fire. But brothers and sisters, there's something also that I want to share with you as we think about the reality of hell and what Jesus says about it. We can't gloss over all the things that Jesus says. Like Mark 9, 48, where he says, it's there that the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The smoke goes up forever. The bloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever, Jude 1, 13. 
I want to share with you, brothers and sisters, that while hell is a destiny to be avoided at any cost, and while hell is stoned to death with his angels, and while hell is forever in his horrible suffering, hell is not inevitable. Say that with me. Hell is not inevitable. Life is available. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those verses that were read for us earlier from Revelation chapter 20 speaks of the great white throne judgment. It says death, that is Sheol and Hades. Remember those are like jail cells where the dead await final judgment. They gave up the dead. They all appeared in judgment for the great white throne. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. But I want you to see, even in that moment of judgment, that severity of God's wrath, we see the hope of salvation, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Hell is not inevitable. How can we know that we have been saved from our sin? How can we experience the joy of hell canceled and of heaven guaranteed? Only because of Jesus. Only when we come to our senses in repentance. Only when we turn from the things of this world and trust in Jesus as our sole sufficient Savior. Our names are written in his crimson blood in the book of life, never to be removed. Brothers and sisters, hell is not inevitable. 2 Peter 3, 9 reminds us that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise of judgment, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all, all should come to repentance. So in this moment right now, while you're still alive on this current earth, you have opportunity to repent. One day it will be too late, and you don't know when that day will come, do you? No. I don't know when my own day will come. You don't know when your day will come. Many of you can say, praise the Lord. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And aren't you happy about that? Yes. Aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you so glad that Jesus went through hell upon the cross and that you would not have to go through hell forever? Aren't you so glad that because of Jesus, for you, hell is canceled, heaven is guaranteed, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? But let me tell you, brother and sister, the vast majority of people that you encounter every single day in your life, from your job to maybe people in your home, the people on your block to your neighbors, to many people that come to our community events here at church, the people that you see at the grocery store and wherever you go, the vast majority of them are headed to a godless, Christless eternity in hell. And on that day of judgment, when the books are open and every deed and thought and sin is read for the judgment, the great white throne, their names are not written in the book of life. And so that means our great calling as Christians, as the redeemed, is to with compassion and with clarity and with visible demonstration in our lives to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Like lights in the world, a lighthouse in our community, to shine and to share the light and love of Jesus. That's what we are called to do. I'll never forget when I was a young man our pastor, Pastor Gilmore, shared a story about he was driving down the road earlier in the week, and suddenly he had to pull over to the side of the road. Why? Because he was weeping, tears streaming down his face. What caused that? What caused him such anguish? It was because he was preparing to preach upon the very subject that we're talking about today. And he was so impacted by the thought of those that he knew and loved, and even strangers he never met, so impacted by the thought of them going to a godless, 
Christless eternity, separated from God forever in hell, so impacted that he was overcoming emotions and had to pull his car over and just weep beside the side of the road. I wonder, of all the things that we weep for and complain about and it causes anguish in this life, do we weep over the loss? Do we weep over the reality of hell? But not just to stay wallowing in our weeping, do we bow the knee in prayer? Cry out to God to send harvesters into his harvest field. Cry out to God to save the lost, to seek and save and finish the work that he's begun. Do we ourselves, through words and through lives, share the light and love of Jesus with those that we come to meet? My appeal to you is to appeal to the lost. First of all, appeal to God in prayer. Appeal to the lost in spoken word.